front of you there and turn to the book of John this morning, John chapter 17. John chapter 17. As we continue our series about the traits of a true disciple, we started this last week. And by the way, I just want to remind you, I realize that it's summertime and summer vacation time and people are coming and going, those types of things. I want to remind you of the opportunity if you miss out on one of these messages to go back Go to our church website, and you can find it both in audio form as well as video form. The live stream is also there, so that if you are gone on vacation and are not able to worship in a local church, you can always catch things uh, via the live stream also. That's a great ministry that extends ministry of the pulpit here at First Baptist beyond just the walls of of this church. And so we're thankful for that, and we want to encourage you to avail yourselves of, of that opportunity, especially when doing a series, so that you can see the dots kind of fit together. So if you missed last week... Please go back and listen to or watch last week's message as it uh, was really foundational to what I'll be talking about this week. As we look at the traits of of a true disciple, what should a devoted follower of Jesus Christ look like? What should their life look like? How should they live in light of them saying that they are a follower of Jesus Christ? Because that's what a disciple is, a pupil, a student, a follower, someone who's devoted to and dedicated to a life centered around the very person of Jesus Christ. And so we are called to do that. And I last week showed you this chart, and this is from a few weeks ago, even before that, that was a part of a series that gives the seven different traits that we are one by one studying. Now, last week we covered three Uh, This week we'll cover two, and then the following two weeks we'll cover one. So we're kind of slowing down in our treatment of each of those texts. And that's okay for us to do that and to focus in on these four messages, this whole idea of being a true disciple. A true disciple is someone that is saved. And, of course, we looked at the passage in 2 Peter 3, 9 that emphasized that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. That that is God's will for you. If you've not yet trusted Christ as your personal Savior, he wants you to repent and believe and know Christ as your Savior. Know that your eternal destiny is settled and that uh, your sins are forgiven and that you are going to heaven. And then in, in Romans chapter 12, 1, we focused on the idea of surrender. Again, a familiar passage of Scripture to many of us, and yet I trust one that stirred your hearts anew and afresh with the very concept of being completely yielded to the lordship of Christ and, and allowing him to really truly be the, the lord of your life day in and day out and how that's a, a, a one-time decision, yes, much like salvation, but it really results in a lifelong then dedication and a lifelong yieldedness where each and every day you decide not to live for yourself and instead decide to live for Jesus Christ and allow him to be the lord of of your life. And so we're, sa- we're to be saved. A true disciple is saved. A true disciple is surrendered. And then a true disciple is scripturally saturated. And we looked at 2 Timothy 3 16 and 17. All scripture is God breathed, given by inspiration. And looked at those different traits of how that is then profitable. And then the inference from that that if, if this is true of God's word, and it, and it is, if it's so powerful in terms of the impact it has in our lives, our lives should be saturated by it in terms of study, in terms of meditation, because then alone will it really have the full impact it ought to have in our lives. And we'll come back to that again today because Jesus is going to emphasize that concept in our text in John chapter 17 as well. And so this morning, I want us to move on to number four and number five in this seven part of these seven traits of a true disciple of Jesus Christ, what we are called to be. And trait number four is that of being separated. And right away, you may wonder, well, what exactly does that word mean? What do you mean, Pastor Odo, by separated? Well, it it comes from this whole concept in verse 17, and we'll look there to begin with and then go back and read the entire text. But in verse 17 of John 17, Jesus says this. He says, sanctify them. Those are his followers and future followers. Sanctify them by your truth. The the very idea of the word sanctify means to be set apart. And this word is used interchangeably in Scripture. The word sanctify is translated in the manner that it is here. We also find the word holy or 
holiness or make holy, that typically it's translated from the same Greek word that means to, to set apart. And so the very concept of separation, the very concept of, of sanctification, the very concept of holiness, those are, all, those are all really synonymous ideas that communicate this idea of, of separation because the very essence of holiness is being separated from something and being separated to something. For us to be separated from the world and, being sep and then separated to to God or separated from our sin and separated to a life of godliness, a life of holiness, a life that pleases the Lord. And the thing that we need to not miss out on in connection with this whole concept of, of separation is this, that God separates us. He sets us apart for his use. There's a purpose behind that separation. There's a purpose behind a life of holiness. It's not just a hole up in some cave somewhere singing songs to yourself like a monk. That's not the idea of separation at all. It's for usefulness that God sets us apart and we are being set apart progressively as we grow to be more like Jesus Christ and less like our sinful selves. And so this word separation is a very fitting word to describe what Jesus is going to teach in this text of Scripture in John chapter 17. So follow along with me in your Bible as I read from mine. And I want us to begin reading in verse 9, and, and then we'll read down through verse 19 of John chapter 17. John 17, beginning in verse 9, Jesus is praying, and he says this, John 17, 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep through your name those whom you have given to me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost." except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world." just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Let's bow before the Lord for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this passage of Scripture and the one that we will look at in a few minutes as well. I pray that you would use both of these texts to speak to our hearts. I'm so thankful today that, that uh, your word is sufficient, that it can minister to every person that is here. Thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit that can take the word and use it to address the individual needs of every heart of every person today. So we pray that you would speak to us uh, individually, Lord, that you'd speak through me as your spokesman, your mouthpiece, that uh, you would use the words that you've laid upon my heart to help me not to say what I shouldn't and to say what I should. And we ask that as I do so, that you would be glorified and that your church would be edified uh, through the preaching and teaching of your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God wants true disciples to be separated. He wants them to be sanctified. He wants them to live holy lives. And this morning, I want you to notice three things in connection with that. First of all, I want you to notice the, the defense that Jesus describes here in verse 15 in John chapter 17. Notice the words of Jesus when he says, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times I wish Jesus had just prayed that he'd take us out of the world. Wouldn't it be nice if the moment that you got saved, you got to go to heaven? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You'd be free of all the heartaches and the heartbreaks and all the challenges of this old world. And as soon as you trusted Christ, you'd just, you know, automatically go to heaven. But that's not how it works, is it? And Jesus here even specifically says, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but instead I pray something very specifically. He says this, I pray that you would keep them from the evil one. And the idea of that word keep is this idea of defense. It means to guard. It means to protect. And so Jesus is praying for us that, that we would be guarded from, that we would be protected from the evil one. 
You see, a big part of striving to live a holy life and a separated life is to steer clear of the devil's devices because he is the evil one that is described here. He is the evil one who's very specifically described in, in, in a lot of this word of, in the word of God in the scriptures. He's described as a liar in John chapter 8, verse 44. He's described as a destroyer. 1 Peter 5, 8 talks about him as a roaring lion that, that, that roams about seeking whom he may devour. And so he's a, a devourer as well. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor that we're to put on as, as believers and the shield of faith that it might quench the fiery darts of the, of the wicked one. And so he's described there as well in Ephesians 6 as the, the wicked one. You see, the devil wants to destroy the life of believers. He wants to destroy your usefulness for Christ. He wants to, dis to distract you from following Jesus Christ. He wants to, to devastate your testimony for Jesus Christ. He's all those things. And so Jesus prays that we would be protected from the evil one. I don't know if I've shared this story with you or not before, but this kind of was illustrated in my own life when uh, I was elk hunting in Colorado one time. And uh, we had plans, and there was a group of us that were hunting together, and we had plans of how the day was to go. And part of that plan for the day was for us to separate and go different directions up different mountain sides and kind of sit down and, and uh, wait and see if an elk came along type of opportunity. And so we had gone different directions with the, the other hunters in my party, and I had kind of crossed through this, actually was coming down to this little creek, this little ravine, when I, I noticed all over the ground um, a, a rather gory scene, okay? A, a gory scene because what had happened was a fawn of probably either a whitetail or muley deer had been killed. And so if you can just kind of picture the carnage of that in terms of blood and hair and all kinds of other body parts strewn all over the place uh, because of some animal that had, that had killed this young deer. And so I, of course, you know, went all CSI, animal hunter CSI, you know, trying to sort through exactly what this was. And of course, it was because of that then that, that I, I realized, okay, small fawn prints, that's what this, this was, that's what happened here. But I didn't really look close enough to think in terms of what, what the predator was. I thought in terms of what the prey was, okay? I figured that out. But I wasn't really thinking about the predator that had killed the prey until... I moved away from that scene and climbed up the mountain a couple, maybe not a thousand feet, but, but several hundred yards up the mountainside and found a great big pine tree to, to sit underneath and I, so I could see the valley below me to see if elk were to come along and maybe get an opportunity to shoot an elk. And so there I was sitting on this mountainside, relaxing, taking it easy, when all of a sudden my mind started thinking once again about the scene down by the creek in the valley and what it was that the, what was probably the predator of that prey that died. And it dawned on me as I was sitting there, that was probably a puma, that was probably a mountain lion that had, that had killed that fawn. And of course the thought then went through my mind, I wonder where that mountain lion is right now. And I wonder if that, that uh, fawn was large enough to really give it its fill for a day or two so that it's not still hungry and so that it's not still on the prowl in my vicinity, on the prowl in my vicinity, if you know what I mean. I was really thankful at that moment, by the way, that I was resting up against this great big pine tree because I felt like at least one side of me was safe and the other side, of course, had a 300 Winchester Magnum laying across my lap and I thought, well, if it would have happened out there, it'd be okay, I could shoot it. But then, of course, I went and thought, you know, this is a really big tree because <laughs> for all I know, that uh, mountain lion could be in, up in the tree looking down at me and, you know, dripping drool on my head or something like that as he looked at that juicy hunter down below him. And it dawned on me, I could be the prey. Here I thought I was the predator. After all, I was the elk hunter. I was out there, the predator, looking for some big, you know, bull elk. And in reality, I could be the prey. Well, the reality is this in relationship to Satan. You are his prey. He is a roaring lion who walks about seeking whom he what? May devour. And so when Jesus here prays that we would be protected from the evil one, he's, he's asking that we would be protected from the one who wants to destroy our lives. Satan wants to destroy your life and your testimony for him. 
So what do we do in relationship to that? How do we respond to that? Well, I think we respond with what, what the Word of God teaches in relationship to Satan in that, first of all, we ought to then also pray for our protection as well. Remember, Jesus very specifically said in the Lord's Prayer that we would pray, lead us not into what? Temptation, but deliver us from evil, or in some translations it reads, the evil one. And so for us as Christians, we ought to be praying for that, that protection from the Lord, from temptation, because it's always lurking. The devil is, yes, but also temptation is as well in every single one of our lives. So we ought to pray that the Lord will not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We ought to also take what the Bible says seriously when it tells us to run. The Bible says, flee youthful lusts. Another text of Scripture tells us the, the same thing. Temptation is not something to flirt with. Temptation is not something to think of as, oh, I would never do this, or I would never do that, or I would never fall into this, or I would never fall into that. No, our, our approach to temptation ought to be that that is, that is of the devil, and he wants to destroy me, and the last thing I should do is mess around with temptation. I ought to run the other direction. And so for us, we ought to be praying, we ought to, we ought to be willing to run, and we should never flirt with what Jesus prayed that we be guarded from. We ought to have that kind of mindset toward the devil and temptation. And so Christ prays for our defense that we would be guarded from, that he would, that we'd be kept from temptation. Secondly, this separation not only involves defense, but it also involves a distinctiveness. Notice what our passage of Scripture says, beginning reading in verse 14. It says, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them. Because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Did you catch the phrase that was mentioned there four times? Four different times in those verses of Scripture, you, you get this little phrase, not of the world, not of the world, not of the world, not of the world. And what Jesus says is that I'm not of the world in reference to him, but then he also then says that in reference to us, that, that we are in the world, yes, but we're not of the world. That's distinctiveness. That makes you different from the lost people around you. It ought to make you different. We as Christians are called to this distinctive Christian living. We are not of the world. Some of you may be wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? What is this world? Is it this planet? Is it, this, is it the earth? What, what is meant by that? Well, the Bible teaches a lot about the world, especially in the New Testament. I think this is a definition that should help us understand what the world is in, in light of a lot of other passages of Scripture. The world is this. The world is the evil system of this present age. So it might look a little bit different in 2016 than it looked in 1990 or 1950 or whatever, but it's still the world. So it's the, the, the evil system of this present age that opposes God and personifies ungodly values and lifestyles because it is energized by Satan. After all, he is the prince of the power of the air. He is the one that's behind everything that's going on in terms of worldliness and the values of, of this world and what the world says is right that isn't right and what the world says is wrong that isn't wrong. And so the world is that evil system that, that each and every one of us face day in and day out. I mean, it, it's bad enough that we face, face our own flesh. It's bad enough that we face the temptations of the devil. And it's even worse that we have the world against us as well. I mean, the arch enemies of every one of our souls are our own flesh and the devil and the world. And so we're called to be distinct from this world because we're not of this world. We're different in terms of, of, of values, in terms of lifestyles, in, in terms of, of, of what we do and what we believe, the, uh, the believer ought to stick out. You shouldn't be able to just melt it, meld into the crowd at work and in your neighborhood and, and as you interact with unsaved people because God called us to be different. And the world won't like you if you're different. Did you notice what Jesus said even in relationship to, to that earlier in this passage of Scripture? He says, and the world has hated them. Why? Because the world hated me. And so the more you are truly like Jesus Christ, the more you will stick out in the crowd, the more different you will be, and the more people won't like that. 
Because everybody wants everyone to just conform to what the world says to conform to. And yet we're, we're called to not conform. That was, that was the essence of what the next verse said in Romans 12.1 that we preached about last week. We were in Romans 12.1, but Romans 12.2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so the world is constantly trying to shove us into its mold so that we'd all just be carbon copies of what the world says is right and what the world says is wrong and live according to the world. Then God says, no, don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed, be distinct, be different in terms of your morals, in terms of your values, in terms of how you live your life, what you look like, how you talk. Everything about you ought to be different in light of what Scripture teaches in light of what God's word specifically says. And so we ought to stick out. Have you ever stuck out in a crowd? I don't mean just for being a Christian, but where, where you just felt completely out of place. God has given me the opportunity different times to go on different missions trips. And for the most part, a lot of those missions trips, the American kind of fit in, okay? If you go to South America, it's not too terribly different. Or if you go to Europe, it's not too terribly different than the United States. But I had one opportunity to travel for two weeks in India. And in India, I stuck out, okay? I really stuck out for a variety of reasons. One, of course, being skin color. But the bigger reason was there aren't many six foot five guys in India. Most Indians are a little on the shorter of stature, of size. And so literally, I mean, walking through the airport, there are all kinds of people staring at me. You know, wondering where this big, tall, white guy came from. And, and that was really, truly the, the case throughout the, in, the entire missions trip and throughout the entire country, the, sticking out in the crowd. As a matter of fact, I only met one Indian man in my entire two weeks there. I only met one Indian man that was taller than me. And I'm not even sure he was tall. He was about the same height as me. And he was employed as a doorman at the Taj Mahal Hotel in downtown Mumbai because he was kind of a freak to be that tall, okay? And he wore one of these big turbans that made him look even taller, and he was really, really skinny. And so it was kind of a you know, unique calling card type of thing. This is the guy opening the door, the big tall guy there in the, the, at the Taj Mahal Hotel. By the way, I didn't stay at the Taj Mahal Hotel, okay? We only visited it as a tourist type of place. Didn't stay there on the missions trip. I stuck out. I was distinct. And it wasn't because of Christ, mind you. You need to understand that, that I stuck out. It was because of my physical presence and being the tall white guy that I stuck out. But for us as Christians, we should stick out not because of anything physical, but because of who we are spiritually and, and how we live out being a disciple of Jesus Christ that makes us different in terms of striving to live a, a holy life that is pleasing to him. We ought to stick out. That's distinctiveness. Others ought to see that you as a born-again believer are not just like them, that you've been set apart by God from sin to him for a special purpose. Notice what it is that sets us apart, though. Notice what it is that sanctifies us, that makes us different in verse 17. After these phrases of not of the world, Jesus puts it very specifically when in verse 17 he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So what is it that makes you stick out? What, make, what makes you different? It's following God's word. It's the truth of scripture that transforms your life and mine. It makes us different. It's interesting, even the, the structure of, of the, the Greek here, sanctify them by your truth. The word that's used there means in the sphere of truth. It could even be sanctify them in your truth. It's like we are so encapsulated by the truth of Scripture that it's all over us. It's all around us. We're bathing in it mentally and spiritually. And the Word of God has such a transformative uh, power in our lives that we're changed by it. We're changed in terms of how we think. We're changed in terms of what we do. We're changed in terms of even how we speak because of the Word of God. It changes us. And so it's fitting, even in light of what we said last week, for us to understand that you will never live a transformed life, a holy life, if you're not saturated by Scripture. And that's more than just going to church on Sunday. That's reading it for yourself. That's making it the meditation of your heart and the focus of your mental energy. The first step toward leading an unholy life is the neglect of God's Word. Or as D.L. Moody put it in the front of his Bible, he said, sin will keep you from this book or this book will keep you from sin. 
how true, how vitally important the word of God is in our sanctification, our separation, our distinctiveness. So many Christians today wonder why they struggle to live the kind of Christian life that God wants them to live, and yet they're not in the word. They wonder why their marriage is failing, or they wonder why they use words they ought not to use, or they wonder why they battle with lustful thoughts or covetousness, or there's a lack of contentment or depression, or whatever else it is that they're, they're faced with in life, and they wonder why that, that never gets better. They wonder why they're not living a victorious life like they ought to, but they're not in the Scriptures, and until you are in the Scriptures and your life is saturated, you won't. And it doesn't mean that once you saturate your heart and life in the scriptures that everything's perfect, okay? Don't misunderstand me, but it makes a difference. So we need to saturate our lives with the word. And you'll notice, by the way, if you're in the scriptures every day and that's what you're thinking about throughout the day, you will notice the difference. Just try it. In terms of your mental focus not being on the things of this world and the temptations all around us, and the, and the strength of Scripture will, will have a transformative power in your life. God's Word, sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. And so this distinctiveness for us as a Christian is rooted in the Scriptures. There's a defense, there's a distinctiveness, and then thirdly, I want you to also notice the design Look at what he goes on to say in verse 18. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. The design has a, has a there's a purpose behind this. Okay, holiness is not just something where we as Christians live these holy lives and, and we pull ourselves away from the world and we go isolate ourselves to where we're not in contact with anybody in the world because after all, they might have a negative influence on us and it turns into isolation. That's not at all the case. Actually, Jesus says just the opposite here in verse 18 when he says, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. So the design is that we are sent. God has a reason for us to live a holy life, and that is to impact our world for Christ. After all, why was Jesus sent into the world? To seek into what? save that which was lost and here he says just as you sent me in the world i'm sending them into the world we've got the same mission that jesus christ had and so holiness and separation is not a matter of retreating from the world it's it's all about impacting a world and it's so important that we live holy lives because that's what distinguishes us and that's what makes us different and then that's what causes people to see that oh, there's something different about them that they have that I don't have. You see, a worldly church will never reach a dying world. There are those that, that, that in the modern church and especially evangelical Christianity here in America that have adopted this model of, you know what, we need to be as much like the world as we possibly can because then we can relate to them. Or then they can relate to us. And so let's do everything we can in terms of even the way we model our worship services, in terms of how we act and, as Christians, and let's just try to be as much like them as possible. That way we can be buddy-buddy, and that way they'll come to know Christ because we're just like them. That's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus teaches the opposite. He teaches this sanctification being set apart so that then we can reach the world. And so a worldly church will never reach a a dying world. After all, why would they want what we have if what we have is just like what they have, right? And so he calls us to, to separation and holiness. I think it's important for us to understand, secondly, that separation is insulation. It's not isolation. Someone else has put it that way, and I think that's a, a great way to describe it. Holiness is not, it, it's not isolation. It's insulation. You realize that, of course, we live not very far from an Amish community that would interpret passages of Scripture like this in the terms that then they have applied to to living. And that the reason that the Amish live like they live is because they don't want to be worldly. They don't want to be of the world. But they've taken that to an obvious extreme in terms of things like electricity and other modern conveniences that they think are worldly that really are of no worldly nature in terms of being bad, being bad for us. 
Not that those things can't bring bad things, I realize. But what has happened then is this idea of separation has been taken to an extreme where the Amish now live in almost utter isolation. If it wasn't for the fact that they, you know, make really nice furniture and we really like their baked goods and their buffets are absolutely incredible, there wouldn't be a whole lot of rubbing shoulders with the rest of us. Normal folks, so to speak, okay? Because they've become so isolated from the world in an attempt to, to not be worldly that they've gone to an extreme. That's not what the Bible's teaching here, okay? It's not isolation. You know, for me as an outdoorsman, there's part of me that would love to just go live in some faraway place in Alaska and just get away from it all where I had no influences of any outside things, you know, and I could just hunt elk and be hunted by mountain lions all the time type of thing, okay? But that doesn't work. That's not God's call. We're not called to, to, to be monks or to be hermits or to be secluded or to be completely off the grid, so to speak, because that's the world, so to speak. No, we're called to be, yes, insulated and in that we make sure that we're cautious and careful about the influences of the world, that we minimize those as much as possible. That's insulation, but that we're not just isolated from a lost and dying world because Christ calls us to go into that world and to impact that world for Jesus Christ. Personal holiness should always complement evangelism rather than be a substitute for it. You realize there are those who have, who have completely said, you know what, evangelism, that's not my thing. I'm just going to live a holy life. Reaching people, that's not my thing. I'm just going to live a holy life. That's not the, the totality of the teachings of the Word of God. And far too many Christians are content to, to hide in their holy huddles and do little to reach their world for Christ. That's not what Jesus is teaching here. Holiness complements your witness because of the power of a transformed life that makes you different, that, that causes unbelievers to, to wonder, what, what is it about him and what is it about her? and Why aren't they like everybody else in terms of lifestyle? And that's a platform then for the gospel and being able to share that gospel with other people. A lot of believers are living holy lives so far away from the world that the world has no clue that they're there. And so a holy church must make a concerted effort to reach a dying world. And that's, of course, not just true of the church. That's true of you and me. We as believers must never compromise on holiness, but we also, on the flip side, must never lose track of the idea of reaching people with the gospel of Christ. And so we're called to separation. Is your life a holy life? Are you living in a manner that pleases him? Are you running from those temptations? Are you willing to be distinct? Are you willing to stand out and stand up for Jesus Christ? Is the word of God what is transforming you to make you less like your sinful self and more like Jesus Christ? And then is that the platform from which you can proclaim, here's the reason for the hope that lies within me. Here's why I'm different. It's Jesus Christ. And share the gospel based on that platform. So we're called to separation. A true disciple will be someone who wants to live that kind of life. But then secondly, and quickly, we're not only called to separation, we're also called to service. Turn, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11. He wants us to be saved, he wants us to be separate, or surrendered and saturated and separated, and he also wants us to be serving. And this little verse of scripture actually two short verses of scripture we see some really powerful truths in relationship to service for the child of god notice what it says there in first peter 4 beginning in verse 10 as each one has received a gift minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of god four different things i want you to note quickly here this morning in this and then the next verse of scripture first of all there's a reception and the reception is this that everyone has a spiritual gift notice how it's stated there in verse 10 as each one has received a gift referring to the spiritual gifts that are given to the child of god the moment that you trusted christ as your savior you received at least one spiritual gift and that spiritual gift is intended for you to then use for the, for the body of Christ, for the church, to build up the church. And so everyone has a gift. Everyone is gifted by God to serve. 
1 Corinthians puts it this way. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 7, it says that the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. God gave you a gift spiritually for the benefit of other people. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11 goes on to say this. It says, distributing to each one individually as he wills, which means that the Holy Spirit gave each person at First Baptist Church, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, he gave each one of you at least one spiritual gift that's not yours just to hang on to or to hide. It's yours to use for the betterment of the body. And so the reception, but then notice, secondly, the responsibility in relationship to that, as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another. The responsibility is that to then use that gift for God and his church. The word minister there means to serve. And so we're called to serve. God's given that you your, your abilities for one reason, to be used for the church. Why do you have what you have in terms of spiritual gift or gifts? For other people's sake. God has given it to you for that reason. And as I was thinking about this, one of the things that came to my mind is that Sometimes we have things we never use. Something that maybe even somebody gave to us that we never use. Maybe even a, a tool that you never use. I remember once upon a time, and I don't remember all the specifics of this, thinking that I needed a dado blade for my saw. How many of you guys know what a dado blade is? Good. After the service, um, you could probably tell me more about how to use that thing, okay? Because I have a dado blade, all right? And I know it does some pretty cool things, but it's been so long since that was explained to me exactly what that cool dado blade does. And I've never actually used that dado blade. It just sits in my garage. I've never once used it, but I know at the time I needed it, right? Because it was gonna do some really cool things. And now it just sits there in my garage, not being used. What's the point of that blade if it's never being used, right? What's the point of you having a spiritual gift if you're not using it? What's the point? God gave it to you to use it. God gave every, every one of us a spiritual gift to use for the church. And so we have a responsibility for that. And so there's a reception, there's a responsibility, and there's a reason. Verse, verse 10 goes on to say that we might minister to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You are God's steward. The idea of a steward was a slave who managed someone else's property. Managed the master's property. And so even our gifts are, and our abilities aren't ours. It's not my gifts, it's not your gifts, it's God's gifts. They're God's. And so we're to be, a, be good stewards and be good managers of the gifts that he's given to us. Because after all, we'll, we will be held accountable for how we've used those gifts. That's the whole point of the, the parable of the talents that you read about in the book of Matthew. Where one was given five, and one was given two, and one was given one. And every one of them were, were held accountable for how they then used those talents and invested those talents for the Lord. Of course, the talent there was not a talent like we think of it. It was different than that. But the idea is the same, though, in terms of God's given you so much, and he expects you to do something with it. Because after all, what did he say to the one that just buried his talent? Jesus very specifically says in that parable that that, that person is called a wicked and lazy Servant, Have you ever thought of spiritual laziness as being wicked? Jesus said it. Not serving is being wicked? Jesus said it. And so we're to use our gifts for him and for his church because we're stewards that will give an account someday. For us, it'll be the judgment seat of Christ where we'll give an account of our lives and whether or not we've used the gifts that God has given to us to serve him and make a difference in and through our local church. And so the reason then is followed up by the response. And the response is found in verse 11. And I won't develop this this morning for sake of time, but notice how two different types of gifts I think are described here. The, the speaking gifts and the serving gifts. And in verse 11 it says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God, as if, as if the mouthpiece of God, if you are in a teaching, preaching, Bible study leading type of ministry, be careful, take that seriously, because when you say, thus saith the Lord, it better be thus saith the Lord, and not just thus saith Pastor Odell, or thus saith somebody else. Be careful that what you say is, is grounded in Scripture. And so take it seriously, the speaking gifts, and then take seriously the, res the, the, the serving gifts and the responsibility of serving, because then it goes on in verse 11, if anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. 
I don't have time this morning to walk through this, but I wanted to walk through the, the speaking gifts and how that fits in a local church. I wanted to walk through the serving gifts and how those fit in a local church. But just trust me, there are all kinds of opportunities. If you, if you sense God has given you a speaking gift to teach, all kinds of opportunities to do that at all kinds of levels, from the littlest of kids to the, to the adult Sunday school classes and everything in between, where if God has given you that gift, some kind of speaking gift, you ought to be using it. Probably for the majority of the church, though, a larger number of the church, they don't necessarily have a speaking gift, but they have a serving gift. That's this minister that is mentioned here when it says, if anyone ministers. And, and there are so many of those that I couldn't list them if I had the entire morning, probably, in terms of ministry gifts and serving gifts and behind-the-scenes types of gifts. But I say all this, I'll say all that to just summarize it in this question, okay? The question is this. What is your job at First Baptist Church? Because if every one of us has a gift, at least one, then every one of us should also have a job. I don't mean job in the bad sense. I mean job in the good sense in that every one of us ought to have a specific responsibility where you say, this is what God wants me to do in and through First Baptist Church in light of my giftedness. Everybody has a gift. Everybody ought to use it. And so everybody in, in First Baptist Church ought to be doing that, ought to be serving. And if this morning you're struggling with, well, I don't know what to do, please talk to one of the pastors. Please talk to one of the deacons and ask them and connect with somebody and we'll find a place for you to serve and it might be behind the scenes. We have a guy that's coming every day just to water the plants and the landscaping. Is that serving Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's just as important as any other ministry because it's making a difference in just a little way, but a great way. And that's serving Christ. And so we're to minister our gifts. True disciples are separated. And true disciples are serving. How closely do these traits this morning resemble your life? Are you living a holy, separated life? What area or areas in your life do not display the holiness of God? How do you need to change to be distinct? How actively are you serving at First Baptist Church? What's your job at First Baptist Church? And I realize that I have found as a pastor there are typically three excuses for people that don't serve. Number one, I'm too young. That's not true unless you're still in diapers, okay? And you're not in here if that's the case. Number two is I'm too old. And again, unless you are incapacitated in a nursing home, you're not too old. There are still areas where you can serve Jesus Christ in and through our church. I know some of you have a tremendous ministry of prayer. You can still serve. And the other one is I'm too busy. Too young, too old, too busy. And of course, we're all as busy as we choose to be. And all three of those, I would say, I would encourage you to try practicing all three of those right now for the day when you stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And all of a sudden, too young, too old, too busy, it goes out the window. Because all of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and be asked how we served. So he's called us to serve. Are you serving? What's your job? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you would use it in a powerful way in our hearts to bring about change. Lord, you know the need of every person here and how this has maybe hit home. I pray that as it does...